you very much, Isabel. Thank you, Sumi, uh, and the Workshop Collective for organizing this amazing um, two days. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us for this roundtable discussion, which is part of the workshop on the epistemic urgency of conceptual diversity. My name is Nazanin Shahrukhni, and I am um, Assistant Professor of Gender and Globalization. Um, I, I still like to say here at the LSE Gender. Let me stress at the beginning um, that accessibility has been a priority at all stages of planning this uh, of this workshop. Live captions are provided throughout and speakers texts are uh, available on our website. Live interpretation to and from Spanish um, have been available throughout the two days. Um, this is to enable one of our speakers to participate fully in all parts of um, the workshop. Um, so moving to the workshop. Um, not only has the rich discussions over these couple of days stressed the epistemic urgency of conceptual diversity, but also gave us insights into pathways of achieving it. The urgency lies in the epistemic violence inherent into our concepts that, to echo Sabah Mahmoud, enable specific modes of being, responsibility, and effectivity, and disable others. Not only do the concepts we use overlook, brush aside, silence, but they also, um, through their materiality, destroy modes of being. The discussions provided insightful reminders about the centrality of integrating relentless productive critique in our conceptual toolkits as a means of fostering and invigorating conceptual diversity, but also of the urgency of challenging our knowledge production models by zooming into the realm of dailiness and the words and actions of actors in their everyday context as the source of new concepts, grounding the production of concepts, um, so to speak. Our speakers sitting around this digital um, table have been at the forefront of engaging in such efforts. And so I personally very much look forward to their reflections and insights they're about to share in this round table and the discussion that will ensue. None of them needs introduction. Nevertheless, it gives me great pleasure to uh, read their names and affiliations and be reminded of their great contributions to critical knowledge production. I will do, do so in order of um, appearance on the program. First, um, Aicha Chubukju is Associate Professor in Human Rights and Co-Director of LSE Human Rights at the London School of Economics. A transdisciplinary scholar, her research focuses on human rights, cosmopolitanism, political violence, internationalism, and transnational social movements, among others. Tony Hostrup is senior lecturer in international uh, politics at University of Stirling. She has worked in the area of global governance of security via regional security institutions and research, and her research broadly explores the nature of global power hierarchies in knowledge and practice. Marsha Henry, my dear colleague, is an associate professor at the Department of Gender Studies and a founding member of the Center for Women, Peace and Security here at the LSE. In her research, she has concentrated on documenting the social experiences of living and working in peacekeeping missions, particularly in the Global South. Shirin Rai is professor in the Department of Politics and International Studies and the director of, uh, director of Warwick Interdisciplinary Research Center for International Development. She has written extensively on issues of gender governance and development and gender and political institutions. And I am particularly eager to read more of her work on depletion at the human costs of care. Wendy Siegel um, is a professor of uh, another dear colleague, but also the head of my department, is Professor of Gender and Family Studies and the head of the Department of Gender Studies at the LSE. Most of her research is qu uh, quantitative and applies both econometric and demographic methods to the analysis of survey data. However, she has also published pieces critiquing how quantitative methods are applied and how quantitative evidence is used and interpreted, particularly in a policy context. Last but not least, Kalpana Wilson, is a uh, lecturer in geography at Berbick. Her research explores questions of race, gender, labor, neoliberalism, and reproductive rights and justice, with a particular focus on South Asia and its diasporas. So I welcome you all. The total time of this panel is 90 minutes. 
60 minutes will be given to our six speakers, so 10 minutes each. I will try to send you a, per, a private message um, one minute um, before the 10 minutes end. And the rest will be in the form of a conversation, both I'm hoping among the panelists, but also between the panelists and the workshop uh, participants. So um, Aicha, uh, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nazinin, and thank you very much to Sumi, to every organizer, and if I may say, activist who has worked in the production of this groundbreaking workshop. Uh, let me begin by the confession that uh, over the last two days, I've been in listening mode. Uh, I do have things to say, but uh, I will not be using my 10 minutes. I thought it would be perhaps uh, a bit more generative rather than giving answers, uh, posing some questions that may seem naive uh, at first sight. Um, but I am at a point intellectually, and I think many of us are, because of radical political movements on the ground all around the world, uh, of rethinking many uh, of the concepts that uh, I've come to use in my scholarship, in my activism, etc. So the spirit of my contribution is very much the hope that the round table can take as much time as possible to address some of the questions that have been implicitly raised and often implicitly by the many wonderful panelists who have contributed their thoughts over the last two days. So uh, when I was first invited to present reflections for this uh, workshop on the epistemic urgency of conceptual diversity, reshaping knowledge production in the social sciences, I sat with the title for a very long time, attempting to decipher it, its meaning, its motivations, its invitations. The urgency of the title made sense to me immediately, as did the idea of conceptual diversity, although I will admit that to a lesser degree. Now about the subtitle, I thought, like many of the panelists over the last two days, what in fact is knowledge? How do we recognize knowledge when we see it? and what manages to count as knowledge. More importantly, perhaps, who decides the very criteria, and in my own work, I've been interested in tracing histories of such criteria, who decides the very criteria for conceptualizing X as knowledge and Y as something other than knowledge, as an opinion, perhaps, an interpretation or else as political propaganda. I, I don't need to remind any of us of the kind of global attacks that gender studies and decolonial movements are under uh, everywhere um, as interpretation or else as political propaganda aimed at conceptualizing and thus help shaping the world in a specific way. Now, in preparation for this workshop, hoping to be provoked into deeper thought, and I wasn't disappointed, I studied the recent book by François Verges, uh, which I highly recommend, A Decolonial Feminism, which was published by Verso earlier this year. While the book is truly generative, I will confine myself to two remarks, one uh, shorter than the other, the last one a bit shorter than the other. Now, first, in decolonial feminism, Verges positions the struggle for epistemic justice as a struggle that demands equality between knowledges and contest the order of knowledge imposed by the West, which demands equality between knowledges. I was really struck by this demand or by the struggle for epistemic equality and the articulation of epistemic justice as a struggle for 
epistemic equality. So it struck me forcefully by the equivalence it affects between justice and equality, and that, uh, and at that, epistemic equality. Note that in Verges's version, epistemic justice is not only about epistemic diversity. So there is something specifically to be done with the epistemic diversity that exists in the world, i.e. produce some kind of equality between uh, epistemies. So instead, it is about a particular approach to the epistemic diversity already existing in the world, one that seeks to create equality between different epistemies. But I couldn't help but wonder, and this question persisted over the last two days, and it was raised anew, among which types of knowledges is this equality to be affected? In other words, are we in this workshop, granted our differences and everything, looking for an equality between every type of knowledge or are some knowledges implicitly asserted as to be valorized, whether they are positioned as quote unquote local, indigenous, or activist knowledges? And if so, why? Um, so, um, this the other question uh, that uh, Verges raised for me by claiming that epistemic justice is about epistemic equality. How can, what can epistemic equality truly mean in the context of the social sciences, whether practiced in the global north or the global south, in the west or the rest, as hegemonically predicated as that enterprise called the academy on the epistemic authority of the social scientists. I know these are not new questions. Uh, I know many of us raise these questions implicitly and sometimes explicitly in our presentations. I'm very much hoping that this round table will um, provoke us into speaking anew to these uh, longstanding questions. The thought that motivates these reposing of these questions is my uh, increasingly strengthening awareness uh, and suspicion about the limits of knowledge production in the academy. How far are we willing to go, I would like to ask, not only in earning our epistemic authority, but also in relinquishing it in the academy, um, uh, in declining, for example, as Mahvish Ahmad was speaking about in the two panels before, declining to bring everything to the academy. Can we speak about epistemic secrets to be kept? Um, and what would that entail in terms of the project of reshaping knowledge production in a decolonial uh, direction? My last remark is also inspired by Verges, although I will end also the practical work of the decolonizing sociology and decolonizing LSE initiatives that uh, I've been involved with over the past two years. Now, if as Verges insists, I quote, decolonial feminism accepts the existence of other feminisms and that it does not wish to be the theory. What then is the task of decolonial scholarship in the academy and not the production of theory? Uh, how can we think about that task today? I will leave it at that, thank you. Thank you very much, Aisha. Aisha. You did well, nine minutes, that was great. <laughs> um, so um, now we move on to, I believe, Tony. I'm sorry, Tony Hartsum. 
thank you very much. I will try to read from my notes just so that I'm able to also keep to time and so that everyone can follow along. And thank you, Aisha, for that uh, very staring start. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about this theme, uh, the theme for this gathering for a few weeks now, thinking about what to say, mainly because I continue to doubt that there is anything new under the sun. So as much as I've been looking forward to today, uh, preparation was delayed and has been slightly excruciating. Uh, is there something I've used, engaged with, that has been uniquely or unique conceptually uh, so as to articulate a difference or better? I don't think I've landed on anything, but I keep getting drawn to the concept of the local. I am troubled by the concept of the local, or rather its meanings, within ostensibly more critical approaches to practices like peace building and the scholarship that has engendered reflection. It has multiple meanings, and my unease stems from the limited potential it has to be emancipatory. I reflect on it as an African in Europe who is just as much a European working on Africa, a scholar trained here and there. So for some context, I've worked on the European Union's engagement in Africa for a while now, and this interest has evolved to look more broadly at how global racialized and gendered hierarchies are produced and reproduced. This seems relevant in the context of a relationship defined by colonialism, and one in which the local can engender multiple meanings, as I've previously stated. In that context then, am I local? Who can be local and local to where? Even more importantly, where does the local fit or is it still relevant within explicitly emancipatory frameworks like feminisms, which are already, already imbued in our participatory frameworks and invested in transnationalism? In short, I'm trying to make sense of how the local is theorized to include diasporic bodies and thought as distinct and among knowledges that inform emancipation. Let me say a little bit about why this is important, at least to me. My encounters with the local first came through the idea of local ownership. The European Union is an extra regional actor in Africa, which is anomalous. To countermand the usual critiques around colonialism, coloniality, asymmetric relations, etc., the EU has often emphasized the idea of local ownership. This refers to efforts to get locals to buy in to peace building practices that emerge externally. The prevailing assumption is that the good comes from outside and where locals are involved, the outcomes are better. The gaps in peace building, however, would suggest we are still missing a trick and this remains unresolved. But do we find the same challenges in the context of other arrangements that are ostensibly informed by more emancipatory ideals? Specifically, I'm trying to reconcile the possibilities of the women, peace and security agenda and the acute search for the local in the processes of implementation, but also in how we speak about the agenda. In this iteration of the local, um, global North countries are positioned as being uh, more knowledgeable about what WPS is and what it should entail. However, I have found that this has only heightened my unease in the research that I've done with uh, Jamie Hagen of Queen's University Belfast particularly because of the ways in which the Global, North, um, the Global North's emphasis on the local is invested in othering recipients of women, peace and security policies and invariably sidelining them in the stories we tell about the practices of this global agenda. The dominant literature is alibi to this, even those that aim to critique the practices of WPS implementation. So the unease with the local is as much about knowledge produced as it is about the policies that are practiced. Global North countries focus on global South countries in implementing WPS agenda. For the most part, the scholarship, or I should say the dominant scholarship does this too in affirmation or critique. The local can only exist therefore over there, outside of the global North. 
A deeper analysis into these practices of the global north has found that this continued assumptions about the other replicate historical and continued racial hierarchies of the global order. Yet much of what justifies north-south interactions in WPS are calls for localization. In this way, what originates from in the global south outside of the interaction with the global north is effectively erased from the narration of the local. This has the practical implica implication that the emancipatory and transformative potential of the WPS is limited. So what does this mean from, for the original point of departure? In a way, it is about where I find myself in searching for the local as an answer to current gaps in contemporary peace and security practice. And I'm, and I'm both off North and South. It allows me to observe, I guess, a level of acceptance, but never quite untethered from the North. How is transnational knowledge born of diaspora conceived in the search for the local, particularly when there is an explicit rejection of those hierarchies uh, that I've identified? And when to survive in a way in the schema that is dictated by the global north re relies on acquiescing to the status quo. So for me, decolonial thinking gives some freedom, I think. And uh, like Aisha, I've also been reading uh, <laughs> Burgess. Um, and in addition to that, a new collection by uh, Desiree Lewis and Gabeba Badaroon called uh, called surfacing on black feminism emerging specifically from the global south and South Africa specifically. I think uh, this scholarship has been useful because it's sort of um, validated the extent to an extent how my unease with the local is entwined in my own biography. But also the way in which uh, Lewis and Badrun reject rigid notions of who is local by rejecting the essentialism of mobility to include diaspora knowledge as part of the corpus of the local. And so in this way, I think sort of decolonial feminism, the black feminism that centers the global South, which I think is distinct from a, a existing or dominant approaches, even um, those that are adjacent, one could argue conceives of the local that, it, that is a source of richness and that knowledge is not contingent on the frames of the global north. It rejects bifurcation for transnationalism and I think moves my thinking beyond prevailing forms of criticality, including within feminism that reproduces that global racialized and gendered hierarchies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony, for um, these insightful uh, remarks. Um, so um, next, uh, we have Marsha Henry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone um, for, um, for waiting so patiently for this, um, this final panel. So I'm going to talk a bit um, about um, the necessity of critical race feminism in um, thinking about gender, peace, and security. So um, in a sense, I diverge in a way from um, Aicha's first um, sort of opening by, um, you know, and I think that was such a generous and um, provocative opening about how we should think about epistemic um, equality if, um, if, um, yeah, and and I think um, Tony has has very much started to already embed the um, her comments into thinking about the local, and thinking about applications of some of our epistemic discussions. So I want to talk about um, very specific um, conceptual frameworks and very specific applications. So this year sees the equal celebration and criticism of all that is associated with UN Security Council Resolution 1325. So, um, well, that was actually last year. On the, on the one hand, marking the 20 years that have passed since the inception of 1325 signals that issues regarding gender, peace and security have steadily remained on the global humanitarian agenda and to some extent in the public spotlight. On the other hand, increasing contestations over different aspects of the United Nations centered women, peace and security WPS agenda from activists and grassroots organizations calling out superficial and empty handed state promises and academics challenging gendered 
and sexed binaries, colonial hangovers, and the continued dominance of Global North-centered programming has meant that 1325 and related resolutions remain problematic in the eyes of many feminists in particular. While the numerous collections of essays published in the last years attempt to address the more critical interventions in debates about protection, prevention, participation, and post-conflict reconstruction, drawing on a variety of theoretical traditions, such as continuums, variations, and political economies, alongside more recent uses of queer and post-colonial theories, there lacks an interrogation of gender peace and security and women peace and security from the perspective of intersectional and critical race theorists. What can we learn about peace and security from critical race feminism? And how is this vital to thinking and acting in the next 20 years of the WPS um, frameworks? I start from the argument that whiteness is central to the operation of WPS as a normative and political practice because of its current manifestation in and from global governance institutions. However, I illustrate the foundational aspects of whiteness and the WPS agenda by focusing on academic settings. I put forward the argument that GPS slash WPS in universities is a white knowledge project, which consistently centers knowledge from the geo-epistemic home of the global north. It is also characterized and emboldened by white authority and expertise reflected by the domination of academic publications by scholars in departments of international relations, international law, and strategic and security studies, rather than, for example, departments of peace and or gender studies. As Parashar argues in recent work, the intellectual economy of WPS privileges normative whiteness and the voices of Western feminists who command resources, claim expertise and advanced theories to understand conflict outside of the global north. This is evident in a multitude of ways in academia and university spaces. For example, the domination of, of junior and senior white faculty researching and teaching on GPS the content of syllabi, much of which reflects um, the ubiquity of white and or global north authors, even especially in reflexive and internalized critiques in, of the field of WPS itself. And finally, the range of speakers at events sponsored by universities and other similar research institutions, many of which continue to include women of color, but often and importantly, simply as what Parashar calls case studies, appearing frequently as practitioners, activists, artists, but virtually never as faculty. While as my own presence attests, there are a range of activists and scholars representing diverse perspectives and faculty of color working in these institutional spaces, yet there is a clear absence of black feminists and black academics, as well as indigenous and Aboriginal scholars, especially in light of settler contexts like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, purporting to be leaders in feminist foreign policy. As bodies already out of place, to use Nirmal Puar's um, expression, because they do not constitute what she calls the somatic norm in university settings. Black, Indigenous, and people of color faculty are almost never incorporated into, GPS into the GPS intellectual project as agents of knowledge and expertise. This is especially problematic considering that so much of the WPS agenda is seemingly interested in what I call women over there, women ethnicized or racialized as the archetypal victims of conflict and armed violence, many of whom feature on the front pages of UN and other governance promotional material or on the cover of academic publications too. This is a jarring differential in representational terms when considering the politics of speaking, knowledge production, and resources for academic research and practice. It is as if um, it is as if black and indigenous and people of color faculty cannot simultaneously be the knowers and the objects of knowledge. They cannot be the repositories of GPS, WPS knowledge, and also those in charge of crafting the field, embodying the expertise and speaking authoritatively. This is one of the ways in which whiteness is not only foundational to GPS with its long-standing connections to the fields of IR and law, 
but also productive of the dividends associated with academic capital accumulation. And amongst the diverse feminist approaches to and within GPS, why, for example, have the feminist political economy theorists not considered this lopsided division of labor, production, and representation in academia? Why have the erasures and marginalizations been reproduced in this new formation of institutional feminism and academic gender peace and security? So I consider the adoption of um, critical race feminism within GPS as, um, as, a as an opportunity for discussion on the necessity of taking seriously such theories as intersectionality. So I just wanna give one example of this and then, um, and then uh, hopefully leave it open for a discussion in the final session. Um, so um, my experience is that um, there is a deep reticence in doing this conceptual work and making this epistemic space as there is in almost every part of the neoliberal university. So I point to the necessity of critical race feminism for discussions of gender, peace and security for countering what Gail Lewis and Claire Hemings have recently called the thick suffocating fog of whiteness. Two recent blog posts on women, peace and security put forward intersectionality in relation to discussions of survivor-centered approaches to conflict-related sexual violence and women's violence um, and women's violence and um, women's violence and the law in considering the case of Shamima Begum. Both of these posts address key concern for women, peace and security scholarship and touch on issues of intersectionality in order to highlight the ways in which gender alone as a single axis is insufficient to understand the challenges that women affected by conflict face. The posts demonstrate that when intersectionality is invoked, it is impossible to pay attention to sexism as the primary structure and system of oppression. More importantly, the posts go some way in exposing the interlinkages and interdependence of systems, um, of systems of power and make visible those individuals and groups multiply marginalized. But in rotating attention towards those affected by conflict by buying an intersectional, an intersectional analysis or intersectional, intersectionality as a heuristic device, there is no accountability for using black feminist theories without the presence of black women, a key concern of intersectionality scholars more recently. White feminist academia recircles when it is able to capitalize on black feminist theories without challenging the foundations of power as they are reflected in the university. Intersectionality is a radical concept that originates in the context of black feminist and critical race theories, black women's lived experiences, and as an epistemic intervention in gender studies itself. Intersectionality points to the fact that experiences are never determined only by one system of oppression, such as patriarchy, but are intersected by capitalism and racism, resulting in multiple and cumulative effects of structural disadvantage. This theory has an obvious appeal for those thinking through the complexity of experiences of conflict and post-conflict contexts, as it allows an examination of the multiple layers that structure women's and men's lives. But what happens when black feminist theories are introduced into GPS context, as I demonstrated above, what is the transformative value of such critical theories in the absence of broader forms of inclusivity and equality? An important point to note, black women faculty and scholars are conspicuously absent in these spaces and discussion. In this way, intersectionality comes to stand in in for Black women, as Bill Gay argues in a recent article, and ends up being a technology that draws attention to differences, but without challenging inequalities in both conflict zones and academic settings. And thus, intersectionality without Black faculty tells us something about the ongoing production of white epistemic power. To adapt Cynthia Enloe's words, I ask, where are the Black women in Women, Peace and Security? To conclude, I look to critical race feminism, where, for example, does the campaign initiated by intersectional feminist scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, say her name, feature in discussions about the 20 years of 1325, 
In this campaign, Crenshaw argues that Black women in the U.S. have continually been marginalized, even within efforts to draw attention to police brutality against Black men. In saying their names, Crenshaw indirectly points us to the critical theories that we need to help us challenge the global inequalities that persist and that continue to hinder efforts to make global gender agendas, ones that are also committed to anti-racism. If we listen carefully to critical race feminists in order to expose academic GPS, WPS to scrutiny, we might avoid rehabilitating it and instead have greater conceptual clarity or not and see the centers and the margins that much more clearly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marsha, for um, reminding us about the necessity of uh, critical race feminism in gender, peace and security, but not just that, perhaps in the whole process of knowledge production. Um, next, uh, the, um, next panelist is uh, Shirin Rai. Shirin, the floor is yours. Thank you. You're muted, Shirin, sorry. Still not um, quite there with this mode <laughs> of communication. I was just saying thank you to you, Nazreen, for chairing so beautifully and elegantly and to the collective led by Sumi, uh, who has put together a really marvelous uh, two days um, of reflection on really important issues. So what I will do is I will build on some of the work that I'm doing uh, on uh, social reproduction as a concept to uh, think about um, sort of epistemic urgency of conceptual diversity. And like um, uh, we have heard in quite a few of, of the panels, uh, really, I want to start by looking at the sort of um, think through some of the, the issues around the concept of urgency itself. Um, I'm a development studies scholar, so um, urgency very often, um, of course, tells us uh, that it is imperative to deal with a situation here and now. Now, and there's a temporality sort of, you know, attached to that, which is urgent, and we cannot let this um, go. So even in terms of foreign aid, uh, you have, uh, yeah, natural disasters, and if you, if you leave it too late, help going to people affected by that might be too late. So there's that urgency that comes with, with being presented with uh, immediate harm, all right? Uh, but urgency in development studies is also very often used as a disciplining mode, uh, which is, it is very urgent that we do focus on COVID as we are doing now. And let's let all the issues around accountability, around sort of, you know, other ways of thinking in terms of um, other claims on public spaces or sort of discourses can just wait. And so feminists have written a lot. I remember Marjorie Wolf's um, uh, piece on China and sort of, you know, uh, the revolution can wait because really, the real revolution is happening, which is the nationalist revolution, not the feminist revolution that is also needed. So urgency for me all, always raises these two meanings, uh, which I find really interesting. Um, and in terms of diversity, and uh, of course, the way in which we have talked about it so much at this conference um, is about sort of decolonial or decolonizing and diversity. And so um, putting those two elements together, um, when I look at my own work and think about this concept of social reproduction, I find that work on care and social reproduction is urgent, especially under the circumstances that we find our way, uh, ourselves in. But there is also an epistemic urgency to ensure that the debates on care and social reproduction are diverse and sensitive to location. And that location is geographic, social, and generational. Um, as we have seen in this country, um, COVID and its aftermath have shown how racialized and gendered discourses and policy frames of care have become. Comorbidities, cross-generational -gener households, religious festivals are all reflected through these racialized um, uh, sort of discourses. 
So social reproduction theory claims a space that explores the social relations between production and reproduction, paid and unpaid work, and the gender division of labor at the global and local levels and in their interactions. As a concept, social reproduction can be defined, and there are, of course, um, debates about this, um, as the production and reproduction, the maintenance of life itself, materially, politically, and discursively. And it is also, of course, located in an unequal global geopolitical landscape. So when we talk about crises and urgency, this area of research has never really been as important as in the aftermath of this pandemic when we have experienced as a society the importance of the nature, value, and the costs of care. After a long period of coalescence since the heydays of the social reproduction debates in the 1970s and 80s, and I would really encourage um, sort of, you know, uh, younger scholars uh, to go and read these debates because they were really powerful interventions in, in the way in which capitalism itself was being thought about. These theories had already come to the fore as a way of understanding the unequal effects of global economic slowdowns, uh, slowdown and, and the crash in 2008-9. So post-colonial interventions have pointed to the need of decolonizing mainstream epistemological frames and SRT or social reproduction theory, like most theories is one such frame. So I'm not seeking for it a special place uh, on the contrary. We cannot treat, and I would argue that we cannot treat a social reproduction as a universal concept, even though when we think about the production of life, the act of reproduction um, or human life, I'm not talking about the post, you know, the non-human and the post-human, that's way beyond my ken, but the production of human life, it is universal. We all produce in the same way with a lot of pain, sadly, but, you know, uh, and decentering social reproduction, therefore, at the same time is important. We need to decenter and expand social reproduction theory, I would suggest, through interdisciplinary engagements, but and by contextualizing social reproduction theory and practices within historical and contemporary colonial, neocolonial capitalist social relations and gendered asymmetries of power. And there I will um, go to, um, as a, a, an aside, uh, Tony's focus on the local because I find local as problematic as I find urgency, because maybe I um, read my Marx too carefully, or my A.R. Desai, uh, who sort of, you know, is a Marxist historian in, in, in India, but I find the local is such a contentious space, and the way location, I can, I'm beginning to understand more, but we can talk about this later, Tony. Um, so, the local, or I would say location matters, standing in one place rather than another, whether it is along the boundary of class or race, caste or sexuality, opens up vistas and possibilities that converge as well as diverge. Decentering uh, theory goes therefore beyond the important post-colonial interventions that have pointed to the value of understanding social reproduction through the insights from the global South. Decentering involves making space for knowledges in and from the global south, yes, and also for reconceptualizing mainstream epistemological frames. For example, what is the place of paid and unpaid work in social reproduction theory? Homeworking, piecework, outsourcing of work into homes, all these practices blur the distinction between the private, home, and public places of work. We have experienced this in the current phase of COVID. How do we approach this issue at a theoretical level when the history of Western unionization, working class unionization, has struggled so hard to separate out the two, to keep the, the home away? And of course, as we know, even from liberal uh, feminists like uh, Carol Pateman, it is a trade-off between sort of, you know, 
the, the sovereignty within the home and sovereignty outside. So what do we do with that when these lines are so blurred in contexts which are um, uh, not one of, of the global north? Decentering, I would say, together with Iris Marian Young, for example, can only be a two-way two project, right? Uh, because Marin Young has argued that all those who contribute by their actions to structural processes with some unjust outcomes share responsibility for the injustice. And the responsibility, therefore, end quote, um, uh, to remedy these injustices can be discharged only through collective action. But collective is also a contentious word. <laughs> you know, how do we do collective action uh, without unpicking what we see as the, the collective itself. It is a responsibility of feminists in the global north, I think, to interrogate their own presumptions, assumptions, and po politics of malrecognition of lives lived otherwise. Decolonization, and I find this is something which is I'm coming back to over and over again, is the argument raised by um, Tuck and Young. In, in their uh, really powerful piece, uh, in which they say decolonization is not a metaphor for other things, that we want to improve our society and sort of, you know, uh, with. What they say is that it is the bottom line is the redistribution of land. Now, if we think about land in metaphoric ways anyway, but what are the resources that are needed to uh, make um, social reproduction viable and uh, how to theorize it in, in, um, in this way? And the way I've done it in the 30 seconds I've got left is through trying to decenter uh, social reproduction by the concept of um, depletion. Depletion as the devaluing of care, uh, which produces both mental and physical and collective and individual costs to those who work in terms of the uh, social reproduction. And if we think about the decentering, what it allows us to do is to look at both sort of relationships that invoke love as well as pain, joy as well as exhaustion, solidarity as well as exploitation. And it decenters a middle-class notion of care that obfuscates the complexity of labor of care. It attempts to reveal the costs of care to understand the circuits of power that circulates through the regimes of care. And finally, Linguistically, I mean, when I think about this burden of care that all of us carry and so is at the heart of social reproduction, in Hindi, my language, the words for care are parva, khayal, dekhbhal, parvarish, and these are powerful words, but they do not seem to carry, at least to me, the normative gendered weight of perfect romantic mothering love that stifle attention to the costs of doing care work especially within the home. So I think really, um, uh, as Parvati Raghuram, and, uh, Raghuram has pointed out, uh, there is a need to remain alive to these tensions within care and to see productive potential that they offer in theorizing care, not only in terms of practice, but also an ethic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shireen. Um, Sorry, I took a little bit longer. No, no problem. I hate actually this role because I have to remind people of uh, interrupting people's uh, um, insightful comments and um, contributions. Um, Wendy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shireen. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this roundtable, and thank you uh, to the collective for organizing such a wonderful couple of days. I've really enjoyed myself. And I've learned so much. And I think it was Sumi earlier saying um, she feels like she needs a couple of weeks to process it all. I, I'm feeling similarly right now. Um, I am somebody who's situated kind of differently than a lot of other scholars. I spend a lot of time talking to mainstream social scientists and policymakers. And I teach students who want to do policy. And I think it's important. 
to think about how the way mainstream social science is conducted can be an obstacle for some of the things that people here are aspiring to. So I'm going to share with you a conversation I'm having with some mainstream scholars at the moment in the context of um, being the editor of the 75th anniversary issue of Population Studies, um, which is a journal that originated here at LSE. Um, early on in the work, the editors and I discussed what we most admired about the 50th anniversary issue back when I was a PhD student and what we do differently. Uh, what's really noticeable about the 1996 issue is that all the authors were men from the global north and all were very well established scholars. Representing a wider variety of perspectives became one of our top priorities. We wanted to deliver a celebration of the journal, a critical reflection of the state of the discipline and a hint of things to come. So we asked with all the benefits of hindsight, what issues and topics should probably have been given more attention 25 years ago. Uh, an immediate uh, response to that was Cairo, which was remarkably uh, uncommented on in 1996. Um, but what I missed in 1996 was the kind of critical intellectual history of the discipline uh, of the kind that Susan Greenhall had published the same year, uh, but not in a mainstream demography journal. Greenhall described demography as an insular discipline that when viewed from its margins prompted scholars in other disciplines to ask the following questions. Why is the field still wedded to many of the assumptions of mid-century modernization theory? And why are there no critical, that is politically oriented, perspectives in the discipline? In the 1990s, demographers still clung uncritically to a number of assumptions that were scientifically, ethically, and politically problematic. Drawing on the metaphor of society as a biological organism, the idea that societies develop through a series of similar stages from traditional to modern, depicts the global north as more developed than the rest of the world, much as a human adult is more developed than a child. Um, and so the adoption of European family patterns is assumed to be both inevitable and desirable. With this framework, history is assumed to uh, be a series of punctuated equilibria with huge changes like industrialization requiring institutional adaptation. Viewed in this way, Western family patterns were, in the mid-20th century, often explicitly assumed to have arrived at the new industrial equilibrium and so represented the pinnacle of development. The functionalism of scholars like Talcott Parsons in the US had, by the 1990s, been discredited, but it had been replaced by something remarkably similar. The economistic but equally functionalist assumption that institutions emerged to sol solve collective action problems, evolving or adapting to maximize efficiency, much as the invisible hand of competition leads to market equilibria. In this way, the idea that the less developed, I put that in quotes, world would inevitably become more like us, and importantly, that this was a good thing, uh, persisted. Uh, in retrospect, the idea that mid 20th century social institutions were ever in equilibria was clearly wrong, yet the same problematic assumptions persist even today. A relatively recent theory in demography, the second demographic transition, depicts social change as a series of revolutions, uh, including a gender revolution, which is something that disturbed the industrial equilibrium of the mid 20th century requiring institutional adaptation. Mainstream scholars have uh, described the second demographic transition as a move to a postmodern family where you have late marriage, more divorce, less sort of uh, 1950s, early stable, long-term heterosexual marriages. And they see this kind of new equilibrium being a rejection of that. When this model was critiqued and modified from a gendered perspective, it's not the underlying modernization assumptions that were challenged. They weren't even acknowledged. Instead, they just argued that the second demographic transition was predicting an equilibrium that was a bit too early and that societies were just moving towards a more Swedish style equilibrium and that we have to be patient and we'll all eventually be like Sweden. 
Um, so what we're seeing is not uh, an equilibrium, but part of a transition to the real new Nordic equilibrium of gender equal families. And that is certainly discourse those of you who ever read EU documents are probably familiar with. Um, so I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, how we continue as quantitative researchers to use the same methods that were developed at a time when people were using conceptual frameworks that have clearly been discredited, and we haven't changed the methods. The theoretical legacies then that underpin the problematic conceptual frameworks get retold in different ways, but they don't actually change their character. So what um, might at first seem to be a persistent theoretical commitment is, um, the, I would say, theoretical ignorance and um, a methodological commitment. There's a tendency to use the same methods uncritically that are aligned with problematic conceptualizations of the world. And when you talk to people about changing the conceptual frameworks, that's probably not the right entry point for a lot of mainstream social science scholars. Um, so the persistence of uh, such problematic and indeed narrow conceptualizations of gender, one of the things that um, underpins many of the mainstream uh, conceptual frameworks of social institutions and social change is the sex role model, which has a lot of really useful simplifying assumptions if you want to estimate quantitative uh, statistical models. Um, this sex or gender role model um, assumed that gender is an individual level characteristic primarily produced in the separate sphere of the family during childhood. And when gender is conceptualized in such a limited way, it's very difficult to even think about how gender relations can change except through cohort replacement. The only option is to socialize the next generation of boys differently and hope that their lagged adaptation uh, will lead to better outcomes in the next generation. This narrow and overly simplistic conceptualization of gender relegated it to the private sphere, uh, relegated gender to the separate sphere of the family where it could be studied without reference to the institutions of the public sphere and vice versa. And it wedded the family and gender in a way that persists in how research is carried out today. Uh, so when scholars do not recognize that some theory underlies its analysis, and I would say that's certainly true of demographers and e economists, it's easy to ignore the ethical and material implications of constructing a version of the world through our methods, which is then imposed on those less privileged to speak as their reality. Uh, for example, in 2001, in his presidential address to the Population Association of America, Arlen Thornton posited that the developmental paradigm of modernization theory had been internalized by people who were repeatedly exposed to its discourse of developmental idealism that depicts Western values and beliefs and family patterns as causes and consequences of global development. These implications, um, I, and I know I need to finish, but I've got three sentences, uh, Nazanin. These brief uh, examples and imposition of impositions illustrate how research approaches, descriptive or otherwise, uh, need to be understood as something that needs to be a point of intervention and as a way of open, not of opening a window on the world, but of interfering with it. And if the project is to um, introduce conceptual diversity, we need methodological diversity just as well. Thank you very much, Wendy, um, for shedding a critical light on, on, on an area that's usually kind of treated very uncritically, especially by its own practitioners. So thank you very much. Um, last but not least, Kalpana, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nazneen, and um, thank you 
to to me, to Isabel, and to the whole collective for what's been uh, a really uh, stimulating and thought provoking and very urgent to use that term, uh, set of discussions. Um, and um, I was also really impressed by the the attention and care which was given to accessibility uh, during the whole the whole two days. And on that note, um, since I wasn't able to make my speaker notes available till last night, I'm going to attempt to paste them in the chat. Um, but I think that may not actually be that easy. So um, I may need to do that after my talk. I'll try and do um, it. Okay, thank you. Um, so one of the themes of my work has been the appropriation of feminist concepts uh, within dominant neoliberal development interventions and the way these are used to construct the category of uh, the poor woman in the global south as a gendered and racialized, hyper-industrious and altruistic neoliberal subject capable of providing almost infinitely elastic quantities of labor and untapped resource for global circuits of capital. And embedded in these neoliberal development discourses, I've argued, is a concept of agency uh, as individualized, limited, and oriented towards upward mobility within existing hierarchies of wealth and power. Now, agency here is then invoked to invisibilize and erase oppression and exploitation. Yet this work would have remained at the level of critique for me, were it not for the generous sharing of many kinds by women participants in left-led rural labor and social movements in Eastern India, who exposed me to their praxis, out of which emerges a quite different understanding of agency, which is by contrast collective, expansive in meaning, critically engaged with questions of oppression and exploitation and potentially transformational. Now, during the last seven years for these activists, energies have inevitably been consumed in trying to build effective resistance to the current regime of Narendra Modi in India. I therefore wanted to use this time to reflect in a preliminary way and from a position of solidarity on how this regime is conceptualized by those engaging in two struggles to resist it and what this might imply for conceptual diversity. My location in the UK also raises for me the questions of claims to authenticity, uh, which serve to underpin unequal power relations. And I'm looking at this in the context of the selective appropriation these days of elements of post-colonial and decolonial discourse by the diasporic representatives of the Hindu right-wing political complex to which Modi belongs. So how can decolonial interventions simultaneously challenge this process? Now, the terms uh, Hindu nationalism, authoritarianism, and majoritarianism have been used in scholarship, but for a number of reasons, they've been found to be inadequate, both conceptually and strategically. Participants in a wide variety of ongoing struggles are framing the ideology of the current regime as fascism and their own movements as anti-fascist resistance. So what this means is that activists and scholars have been thinking through what it means to talk of fascism in the global south in the context of contemporary imperialism in a post-colonial state, in a so-called rising economy, and in a state engaged in a decades-long military occupation in Kashmir, which since August 2019 has been viewed as shifting to an Israeli-style settler colonialism. Now, of course, invoking fascism has a particular global resonance and an assumed intelligibility, but clearly the use of the term fascism in the contemporary Indian context is not simply a rhetorical device. If we examine the genealogy of the forces of the Hindu right, at the core is the RSS, an organization formed in the mid 1920s in opposition to Indian independence from Britain. An authoritarian militarist cadre based organization, Mussolini's black shirts were a direct inspiration. 
And then in the 30s, you have RSS ideologue MS Goldwalker uh, notoriously uh, viewing Hitler's treatment of the Jews as a model of so-called race pride, which India should emulate. And then moving forward since 2014, in addition to the relentless embodied violence against minoritized groups by the stormtroopers of the Hindu right, we've seen the enactment of laws in India, which have been seen as echoing Nazi Germany's Nuremberg laws, notably the Citizenship Amendment Act and laws aiming to prevent interfaith relationships between Muslim men and non-Muslim women. So to an extent, it can be argued that European fascisms have been the blueprint and are an important reference point for movements of resistance. But these fascisms, European fascisms, must of course be understood according to their location in time and space. In particular, we must not forget the prefiguring of the fascist state by the violence of colonial states and in particular by the genocide of the over Herero and Nama peoples by the German colonial state in present day Namibia. So what does fascism mean in 21st century India and as it is defined within multiple movements of resistance? Um, the recent uh, Citizenship Amendment Act um, in conjunction with two other laws effectively excludes Muslims from citizenship and is widely understood as a step towards ethnic cleansing. Muslim women, demonized in the discourse of the Hindu right as excessively fertile and an embodied demographic threat, even as they're simultaneously constructed as oppressed by their communities and needed to be saved, are most vulnerable to imposed statelessness. As marriage migrants, working class Muslim women are even less likely than men to be able to provide proof of citizenship in the draconian ways required by the legislation. So in this context, we saw in this December 2019, the emergence of the Shaheen Bagh movement, the occupation of public spaces by Muslim women, which formed the heart of the unprecedented mass equal citizenship protest. The fascism identified in the narratives, slogans, placards, paintings, and songs of the Shaheen Bagh occupations was one whose core ideology is not simply seen as majoritarian, but as Hindu supremacist, understood as inextricably Brahmanical and patriarchal. So gender and caste thus become central to the analysis of fascism which emerges here. And this both emerged from and strengthened a new phase of alliances between Dalits and Muslim women. A year on from the Shaheen Bagh protests and the equal citizenship campaign, last winter saw another sustained occupation of public space, which is still ongoing, the farmers movement against three bills, which essentially herald the takeover of agriculture by corporate agribusiness. It's in fact much more diverse and multiple than the term farmers movement suggests, particularly along gender, caste and class lines. And again, in this movement, we see the characterization of the regime as fascist. And in this case, I want to focus on the understanding of the economics of fascism in India, which has come before in this movement. European fascism of the 1930s and 40s, we know, involved forms of Keynesian inflected economic nationalism, building as other imperial powers, including Britain did, on the plunder of centuries of colonialism. Today, though, we're seeing fascism in the global south in which there is no such element of populist economic nationalism, but rather an unmitigated extractive accumulation by dispossession, operationalized in India through the farm laws, through new labor codes, and through the escalation of corporate land grabs. Of course, today, corporates owned by Indian billionaires are themselves an important section of global capital, but this makes little difference for the vast majority of India's people. And we can see this in the context of the COVID-19 second wave and the Indian government's deregulation of vaccine prices. Essentially, the Indian state is actively colluding in a global system of racialized devaluation of lives. 
this is what is invoked in the characterization of the current regime by the farmers movement as one of fascism and of the era it is ushered in as a new company Raj, referencing the colonial rule of the East India Company. Now the ideology of the Hindu right is itself deeply colonial. The notion of Indian history as one of continuous Hindu Muslim conflict, which they espouse, was one deliberately developed by the British, particularly in the wake of the Hindu Muslim unity within massive anti-colonial uprisings in 1857 and the orgy of colonial violence during and after the uprising. But despite this, core Hindu supremacist organizations have begun invoking decolonization in reference to their promotion of Hindu supremacist exclusivist ideas. Increasingly, for example, caste is claimed to be an Orientalist construction rather than what it actually is, a material lived pre-colonial colonial and post-colonial reality. We've seen this revisionist history being mobilized against Dalit organizations in the UK, campaigning for caste discrimination to be recognized in UK legislation. A second example, which is very immediate, is that of the attempts to delegitimize and discredit the reporting of the scale of COVID deaths in the current devastating COVID wave in India. This particularly targets accounts which have appeared in the international media, mainly by committed Indian journalists facing various forms of silencing within India. This approach claims that such reporting, some of it from cremation grounds, is a racialized and colonial incursion which disrespects sacred rituals. We must be extremely wary of such claims, framed as they are in decolonial language, and how they actively silence the grieving families who have wanted their stories of acute disregard for life to be told, not to mention the Dalit cremation workers who have courageously spoken of the horrendous escalation of what are already deeply exploitative conditions of work. I'm sorry, Kalpana, um, if, if you can wrap up. Um, yeah, I've done my last sentence. I'm sorry, thank you very much. We must take ethical responsibility then to always think critically. And I think this relates back to one of the um, questions which Aisha raised at the beginning. We have to always think critically, not only of the politics of location, but also of the political location that inform a variety of knowledge claims, including sometimes ones which appear to mobilize decolonial critiques and the political work which they do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kalpana, um, for this illuminating discussion. Um, I want to invite all the uh, workshop attendees. If you have a question for our panelists to please share them in the Q&A um, box uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, at this point, I, ha I actually have, if I had prepared and I have now listening to you, I have a few questions, but I want to give the floor to the panelists and see uh, while we're waiting for the questions to come, if there is anything um, um, that you wanted to contribute to the discussion, listening to the other panelists, um, you can raise your hand. Aicha, is that a hand up? Yes, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for um, very provocative presentations from everyone. I'm left with uh, Kalpana's last question, and it was also raised by other panelists on this panel, the problem of appropriation. And I was wondering if fellow panelists wanted to reflect on um, strategies for de-appropriation or how to prevent appropriation of decolonial ideas or even uh, feminist projects. So Kalpana, returning the question to you, if I may. Um, I mean, I think in a way I, I raised it similarly that I don't have have answers, but more as a provocation. So I think it's something that we're all uh, grappling with. But I suppose I thought it was useful to give a specific example where, uh, you know, we can see how uh, this is mobilized by the right in this case 
and this is not a case of a kind of, you know, it tends to be understood as a kind of a reaction very often to maybe, uh, you know, to imperialism or a kind of reactionary uh, response. But here you have forces which are actually completely kind of, um, uh, you know, embedded within uh, neoliberal capital in a sense, which are then sort of, you know, uh, taking on aspects of these these discourses. So I think it's really that whole question of uh, what you also said at the beginning about what do we mean by by epistemic equality? That in a way, the whole question then of of uh, you know of who is who is actually making these claims becomes very central, and where they're located. Uh, within uh, broader structures of power. But I'd like to open it up to the rest of the panel because as I said, I think it's a, you know, it, it's in many ways a question of strategy. Thank you, Kalpana. Um, Shirin, I see your hand up. We have a comment and we have a question comment by one of our attendees. I'm gonna read that and then I'm gonna give the floor to you and the other panelists um, uh, just to include also questions from our attendees. First, okay, um, thinking of travels and locations of concepts, um, the attendees thinking uh, uh, is also thinking of claims, accusations around the appropriation, even co-option of concepts and where such claims can reproduce colonial logics of territory territory and affects of defensiveness, as Jen um, Nash has recently argued around intersectionality, rather than more generative possibilities, which takes us beyond appropriation and deappropriation binaries. So this is a question for everyone. Shirin, I'm, I'm giving the floor to you and then to others if they wanna um, respond to this question. Um, I think this is a really important question and I was, I would like to think that we are moving very cautiously beyond the binary of co-option and engagement. I think that kind of a battle, again, extremely important one, uh, has a very long history, right, in feminist movements. So the worry about co-option, um, but also I think of uh, Maxine Molyneux's work in the context of, of South America, Latin America, um, in practical and strategic interests. I think about strategic essentialism. I think about, um, at the same time, I suppose we are being asked, and that's why I raised the issue um, in my own work some years ago now, uh, built on uh, left movements, um, sort of, you know, practices of engagement, which was uh, in the context of the state in and against the state that we really constantly have to function in that way. Uh, and if we kind of uh, transpose educational institutions, the LSE or Warwick, um, if we um, think of other sort of uh, activist spaces, I suppose what we have all been listening to at this conference, which has been really moving for me as well as really important for me to take away, is this notion of what are the practices of decentering that we need to be aware of, to be conscious of, both inside and outside institutions. But at the same time, and that's where against the state becomes a, 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 an important element of our strategy is how do we hold accountable? What practices of accountability, both to of ourselves, but also of the institutions of which we are part. So I think that my question would be really, and going back to Tony's point about the diaspora, and of course I am very much, I mean, you know, part of that diaspora um, and that diasporic existence um, can be stretched and made open to these interrogations and self-interrogations uh, because, uh, and, and perhaps that's the way to, to address that kind of um, worry or anxiety that we might have in terms of location and the local. 
So I just wanted to put that out on, on the table because I think if we keep on thinking about co-option, then you end up sort of, you know, being um, sort of stymied in political action. And if we keep on thinking about that binary, then it be, sort of, you know, limits our options of thinking otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Shireen. Um... I don't see any other hands up. Um, so if I may, oh, Tony, sorry. So I, I thought I'd just jump in there. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Shireen, for um, your intervention. I think you probably said it better, some of my troubles with uh, what is local and what isn't local, um, it, particularly when, even when we sort of adopt sort of concepts that we're used to, like intersectionality, has to think about race and, and sort of other other characteristics. And yet um, being here of the global north, uh, taking advantage of everything that has to offer, like uh, Masha was describing, still not part of the system, so to speak. So I think I, I would agree that in sort of interrogating um, a, the role of the diaspora, you can perhaps uh, circumvent those um, bifurcations that I was talking about. But I guess specifically on the idea of co-optation, I, I guess I would caution against um, dismissing it completely, perhaps not necessarily with respect to some of the concepts that we've dealt with, but actually the practice and the uses of those concepts. Uh, and I say this obviously based on my specific experience around policy, so to use one example, um, you know, even now when I'm accepting that, you know, there are different ways of thinking about what, a, say, Black feminism is, what, you know, decolonial feminism is, and not to sort of impose the um, on any of those approaches. I also know that, you know, when I think about how the French government is deploying intersectionality, it is actually harmful that that co-optation causes actual harm. We see it, we see what is happening within the state in France and the fact that nevertheless, it is deployed as part of this feminist foreign policy practice. Um, and so I think what, I guess what to end on is that, you know, binaries are not a good thing. And I think any sort of, anyone who is invested in any sort of emancipatory um, understanding of, of critical feminism would uh, try to move away from that. And I really think that this is what we've tried to do um, on this panel. And perhaps because of that, it might be useful then not to think about the idea of co-optation as re-entrenching another kind of binary, but as being explanatory to a very, very specific uh, function that can be harmful and uh, prohibit justice. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. Um, so we are officially we've, uh, we're uh, uh, out of time, but uh, Wendy has uh, uh, something to contribute. So I want to give the floor to her. There are two more questions that have come in, which we will share with the panelists afterwards, because I also know and I want to tell the attendees as well not to leave the webinar because we have uh, Mary Evans uh, uh, offering final remarks after this. So stay with us. Um, Wendy, the floor is yours. After Wendy, I'll just um, uh, mention what the questions are so that we've included all the questions. Um, I, I just wanted to add um, something that uh, Carol Bakke has suggested, which might relate to some of the concerns people have about co-optation. Um, the idea of reflexive framing suggests, like Kalpana said, that everything is used strategically and it is used strategically within a particular um, field of accepted knowledge. And you have to look at the deployment and the field at the same time. You have to turn the framing, uh, you need to turn away from the strategic framing to look at uh, what it's possible to think and what's excluded and what the underlying assumptions are um, because concepts can be deployed in all kinds of ways. Um, the way certain post-colonial discourses are being used within the European Union at the moment is astounding. So not seeing things as, as necessarily co-opted or not co-opted because they're just put to use in a range of different settings, but as a responsible uh, scholar, to turn your consciousness in on itself is how Carol Bakke put it and pay attention to what um, 
the concepts that you're using make it possible to think. Thank you very much, Wendy. So um, the two questions um, are one from uh, Asia, and it's for uh, Shirin, which sh Shirin, we will pass this on to you afterwards. But the question is, in the process of decentering, we define the contours paid, unpaid, new forms of work, domestic market, state, precarity, security, that, that gives us insight into the power relations of um, reproduction. But she's asking, I wonder how this, um, this recontouring or um, this, uh, decentering happens through these re redefinitions. Rabia also asks a question for everybody, I guess. After internationalizations of universities and academia, how can we make sure that basically of the ac accountability practices because we look for authenticity of our work through colonial tools? So I leave uh, the panelists with those um, two questions. I think in Shirin's presentation, there was a quote by Iris Marion Young, which um, in a way, um, reading that code, we all become culprits, right? It's um, all those who contribute by their actions to structural processes with some unjust outcomes share responsibility for injustice. So um, we are all part of academia and we can continue to contribute to that um, injustice produced. But then the solution that uh, she offered and Shirin um, highlighted was that the responsibility to remedy these injustices injustices can therefore be discharged only through collect collective action. And I think going back to Aicha's provocative questions at the beginning, just to complete the circle, is how does that collective action look like? And what does it entail? And who are its actors? Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you to our wonderful panelists for your contributions. And as everybody said, we are left with amazing things to think about for um, <laughs> the rest of our lives, probably. Um, yes. Um, are we ending here? And then Ari comes in, or how is? Thank you. Thank you, Nazanin. Yes, we're, we're, we're doing a small transition so that everyone can take a bit of a breath, but it will be with, please look at your screen and you will have one more of these questions now, but it will be a bit different. We're asking you to share, I know it's hard because of how everyone said that this will make us think for many, many years, but if you could just share a few words that you associate with the workshop of these past two days or how you've felt or something and again you go to menti.com and use this code and then you can you can insert it and then we'll go over to mary thank you and thank you nazanin and panelists <laughs>